Good morning, VGC. How you doing? No, no, it's the second service, man. Y'all will slept in. You should feel good. Good morning, VGC. How are y'all doing? It sounds much better. I'm Daryl Morrison. I'm going to be the pastor here at Valley Gate Church. Excited to see all of your beautiful faces and just grateful for the opportunity to be able to share with you. Uh, to our first time guests, if this is your first time here with us, we want to say greetings to you. We're grateful to have you here. Uh, on the back of the seat, uh, there's a QR code. If you want to, you can go ahead and click that and fill out that information. And uh, we'd love to just connect with you. Uh, and then we also have some folks out on the patio, including me, and I'll tell you why me in a minute, uh, who would love to greet you. So church, can we give a hand clap to our first time guests? All right, so we are, we are, we got a lot of stuff going on. So just want to reiterate that um, first and foremost is in the next couple of weeks, we will have our uh, anniversary service, eight years, which is amazing. Um, stats show that when you start a new church, uh, well, I think it's like 75 to 80 percent of new churches that start uh, disband and they end after three years. And uh, that has a lot to do with a number of things. And more importantly, um, it's kind of daunting to be able to do this. And so we kind of endured through a pandemic, which was crazy. And then we're able to kind of come back through that and watch God do something. And so I'm grateful because I love all of your resilient people, your faithfulness and just your heart to want to be in God's presence and to be with God's people. And so I want to give you a hand clap for allowing us to get to this moment. We have our small groups. Small groups are part of who we are as a community. I believe it's the lifeblood of who we are as a church. Sundays is just a place where we gather. Small groups is the place where we grow. And so these are the places where we get to know one another and get to walk in relationship with one another. So we've recently started those, and we would encourage you uh, just to, even if you want to know about the church, that's probably the best way to do it, get to know some of the people who are part of the church. And so we have a number of churches, I mean a number of small groups. I do mine. My wife and I, we do ours here every other Thursday. And I forget the time. What time is it? 6.30. And so um, I like our small group a lot. And so uh, it's a joy. But we have some awesome, awesome small groups. So please sign up for that. And then lastly, um, we go through this series called Set Apart. We do our, um, our anniversary. And then for us, for a church, that's when I believe it's the beginning of our church year. So after we go out through our anniversary service, then that's the beginning of the church year. And we're going to take uh, the entire year to go through the, the Bible. And so we're going to start in Genesis, reading about the creation story, which I love. We get to talk about evolution, that stuff y'all learned in class at school. My leg up here shaking. And then we get to talk about how God, how God, his story of creation. So... I know evolution says there's a big bang theory. And I always wonder, who banged a bang? You know, if nothing turned into something because something banged, who banged? And then I think about that great theological song, nothing from nothing leaves nothing. You got to have something, right? So I'm going to try my best to dumb it down as best I possibly can. And we talk about the creation story. And then we're going to go through the fall of man. And we're going to talk about how God populated the earth. And we're going to see how this thing called Christianity was birthed. And how this earth that we live on, this world, the cosmos, the galaxies, in my opinion, were uniquely created by the hand and the mind of God. And so I'm excited about that. And so I would encourage you to please join us then. It's going to be an awesome time. But now we get to conclude, continue in our series called Set Apart. Everybody say Set Apart. This is a cool series I'm excited about. Last week we talked about what does it mean to be set apart individually, okay? That each and every one of us as Christians, if we remember the Bible, we were looking in 1 Peter chapter 1. And Peter was talking to a number of Christians who were scattered. They found themselves scattered. And it was because of persecution that harm had come to the people who lived in Israel and people who considered themselves believers in God and more importantly, believers in Jesus Christ. And so they were scattered because of this persecution and they found themselves throughout what they call Asia Minor, which is Rome. So they were pushed out of Jerusalem, pushed out of Israel, and now they found themselves living in Rome. And so there were cities like Bithynia and Cappadocia and Pontus. And so they found themselves there. And what made it even worse is the 
the Roman emperor, his name was Nero, hated Christians. He hated what they believed in. He hated their faith. And so they begin to persecute Christians. Now, here's how bad persecution is, because I know some of us, we feel persecuted when we go to work and our, our co-worker don't believe in Jesus. And I know some of us feel really persecuted sometimes when somebody denies or even tells us we're dumb for believing in Jesus. But persecution here meant that Christians were being killed for sport. They were being large coliseums that we see uh, all of, like I talked about last week, your favorite team. I see one person up in here who I know the devil is up in here because he has a Dallas Cowboys shirt on. That's Corwin. That's my boy. And so just just reach your hand out and pray for Corwin, okay? And so everybody has their favorite team that they go and watch and they love and they all cheer. But think about this. Christians were being gorged by beasts and the Romans would laugh and they would they would scream and they would ask for it to be even done more. Um, You would walk down the street and there would be posts, light posts. But those light posts were lit by Christians who were set ablaze and killed because of their faith. And the and Peter tells them who's the writer of this book, who is actually in Rome, who's in prison, and he's writing to these Christians, and he tells them this. And and I don't know if I'd have told you this, but man, my my dude, Peter, is a dog. Peter is in jail, knowing he's about to be killed, and he tells the people who are being persecuted, here's what I want you to do. I know things are hard. I know you're suffering, but and I know that they are looking for Christians that look like you. I know that they are looking for Christians who go to church like you. I know that they are looking for Christians who come and sing songs. And he says this, I want you to be different. Don't be like them. I want you to be completely different, set apart. That's what this means. Everybody say set apart. I don't want you to be like the world. I want you to be set apart. As a matter of fact, if you're set apart, they're probably going to be able to identify you faster. And I want you to be set apart. And there were four things that we learned last week as related to being set apart because each one of us individually, if we live our life for Jesus, we should live our lives set apart. Each one of us, these should be indicators that we are Christians. That number one, if we're set apart, we live differently because we live for God. And you know, living for God is not cool. Especially if you fasted with us last week. What nothing cool about fasting and not eating for, for five days. Ugh, all of y'all, I guess you were okay. It didn't feel good to me. Day two, I was like, no, God, we have to break this fast. Uh, but I held the home, right? We do crazy things like fast. We, we do crazy things like read the Bible. We do crazy things like that. And so if we're going to be set apart, number one is you have to live for God, which means you're going to live different from the world. See, if you really live for God, you're not going to live like the world lives. Then number two, if you're going to be set apart, you have to see God differently. You have to see him from a different perspective. I know a lot of us make God out to be like he's my friend. You know, like we're boys. We cool. That's my dog. And I'm okay with you having a relationship like that. But as long as you know he is the dog. That he's bigger than anything else. And a lot of us, we try to minimize and make God small so he can fit within our understanding. Or maybe he can fit within maybe our activities. And so... I said this, I said this, that if we're really going to see God different, it's kind of like what, what, what you have to understand is that God is in heaven saying, you better put some respect on my name. I think God is walking around heaven right now, put some respect on my name because that's how big I am. And then if we're going to live differently, we have to love differently. That means love people you don't like. I See, y'all I ain't got no amens in church. This is church, right? Can we say amen? Okay. I know you're not going to say amen to loving people you don't like, but that's what God tells you to do. Okay. We have to love people that we don't like. It says brotherly love. Phileo, Philadelphia. Phileo, the city of brotherly love. And that's the worst city. They don't love nobody. You hear me? So we have to love differently. And then the other thing is we have to desire. We have to be hungry for God's word. We have to want his word. We have to read this word. His word is not something that entertains us. His word is not simply excerpts that help us get along our day. Y'all know, and I'm not trying to say don't use your version Bible, but I want you to use your paper Bible too. Because we just don't look at it real fast. Oh, this is is good. And then go, no, no, open up your Bible. Read that thing. Make some markers. Put some notes to the side. Write some prayers that are so, because when you desire God's word, it's when you grow. So those four things make us individually, individually 
be people who are set apart. So now we get to dive into this next part because when God calls you individually to be set apart, it means that he's calling us corporately to be set apart as well. So our Christianity, as much as it's personal, it's even more so corporate and collegial. Okay? So let's look at this because I think you're looking at me like, oh, he's lying. I'm not. Here's what the Bible says. Okay? We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2. And I've entitled this message, Building a Spiritual House. Okay? If we're going to be a community, not just individuals, but if we're going to be a community of believers who are living out our lives set apart and living our lives for holiness, then we should be building a spiritual house. So 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm going to start at verse 4 just for the sake of time. Verse 1 through 3 is what we read last week, and it talks about how when we come to God, ultimately what we have to do is we have to desire the pure milk of the word, if indeed that we've grown thereby, that we have to desire God's word. Now we begin to transition because he talks about who we are individually as those who are set apart, and now verse 4, he begins to transition. Two things that you're going to hear me talk about is the living stone and then living stones, plural. The living stone and then living stones, okay? So remember, Peter is writing this note to people who are being persecuted. Peter actually does get killed and he's martyred while he's still in Rome. Okay? So you have to think about this from the standpoint he's writing this letter and ultimately he would die because of his faith. Okay? So it says this, coming to him, and I have to stop, every time you see a capital H or you see a capital letter, if it says he, him, I, and it's a capital and it doesn't fit, it means that it's talking about God. It's talking about the triune God. It's either talking about God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. So here's when he's saying coming to him. He's talking about when we, as living stones, as individual stones, when we come to him, talking about Jesus, as we come to him as a living stone. So when we come to him, Jesus, who is the living stone, this stone is rejected indeed by men, but this stone is chosen by God, and he's precious. You also, everybody say you also. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Therefore, it is also contained in Scripture, and here's what they're referencing another Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion, which is Israel, a chief cornerstone. So not just a living stone, now he transitions to a chief cornerstone. This cornerstone is elect and it's precious. And he, you see, the, do you notice the small he now? The small he is talking about us, okay? And he who believes on him will no, by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, and the real word should be, and to those who are disbelieving, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of fence. They stumble being disobedient to the word. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you, here's what you are. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once you were not a people, but now the people of God. Once you had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. God, I pray that you bless us as we study your word. In the Old Testament, um, and this is during the time when I talk about the Old Testament, it's during the time before Christ had come. There were a lot of things that people had to do to experience God's presence. And one of the things that they did is at first we talked about the Ark of the Covenant. That was a small little thing that represented God's presence. And then the priests were carrying it. And then your boy touched it and he died. He, he, had, he had done some things that were not prescribed by God. He had touched God's presence and God's power when he shouldn't. And then he died. So then what they did is what represented God's presence was a temple. 
and they would build and they would erect these temples. And in the middle of the temple, they would put the same thing that we talk about, the Ark of the Covenant, and they would sit it in the middle of the uh, temple because it represented the closest place that you could be as related to God's presence. And so the priests, their responsibility would be to go into the temple and they would offer sacrifices for sinners like you and us. See, because some of us, they would offer turtle doves because we only did that small sin. But for, for some of y'all, they'd have to kill a cow. <laughs> I don't know which one of y'all cow sinners it is up in here, uh, but it's a bunch. You know, no, I'm joking, I'm joking. Okay. And so these priests would go in here and, and they would go in and they would, they would represent us to go into God's presence to make special offerings and sacrifices on our behalf. Because those offerings and those sacrifices represented us being closer to God. Everybody say Old Testament. The Old Testament is very important because it represented the Old Testament. And so your boys, the priests would have to come up in there and they would have to come up in there with uh, priestly garments. But what I recognize, which is kind of crazy, is that they would put a rope around his leg. Because remember, that's God's presence. And we learned that if you're close to God's presence, the closer you are to God's presence, the more pure you should be in your heart. The more close you are to God's presence, the more set apart you should be from the world. So the priest could roll up in there and he could be offering sacrifices for you. And if the priest is not right, guess who's dying? The priest. You know what that string was for? To pull him out. Just in case if my boy died because he wasn't living right and he just thought he was going to go up in God's presence thinking everything was cool. It'd be like, and I. I can't be no priest, but let's say I was a priest, okay? I can't be no priest. Oh, no. <laughs> you feel a little string, and you hear me in there moving and stuff. I'm, oh, God, I just pray that you were blessed with this person. I'm offering bulls for, some, for Corwin, and, oh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm doing all of my stuff, and you can feel the rope. But then what happens when the rope stops? It means I died, and you got to pull me out. You got to pull me out because I died, because I went in there unpure. I went in there defiled. I tried to draw closer to God's presence when I knew my heart was not right with him. And so they say now, when you come to him, when we come to him, when we draw near to him, we want to be in God's presence. We're coming to him because he is a living stone. So when we go into God's presence, when the Old Testament, the priest had to do it. Here's a beautiful thing. When Jesus came, no priest has to go into any building on your behalf. When Jesus came, he tore the veil and you can go in there and spend time with God all by yourself. You can spend time with God at your home. You can spend time with God anywhere that you, because now God has torn the veil through Christ Jesus so that we now have access to God. But remember I said, put some respect on his name. He may not kill us when we come in his presence, but it doesn't mean that something hasn't died in us when we continue to allow defiled things to be in his presence. And so we got to make sure that when we go in God's presence, I know he's your friend. I know he's your boy. I know he's like your brother. I know that you're cool and y'all dap it up with Jesus. But don't forget that there's a place where we still have to respect who he is as God. I know that they call him the son and he came as a little baby and we celebrated that all on, on, on Christmas. But don't forget that he's holy. And remember what we said last time. As the one who has called you is holy, what? You also be what? Holy in all of your conduct because it is written, be holy because I'm holy. You know your greatest call and purpose in life is to be holy. You know your greatest call is to be set apart and not just live according to the schemes and the patterns of this world, but to live differently, to look differently, and to act differently. And I'm not saying weird. I never said weird because I know there are some weird looking Christians and we will not be weird, okay? Weird scares people away from Jesus. Holiness draws people to him. Okay? Hear me? So we have to make sure. I'm not asking us to be weird, but I am asking us to be different. I'm not asking you to think that you're better. I'm just asking you to present yourself as one who is, can demonstrate a heart that I am seeking after God. Does that make sense? Okay. So if we're going to build God's spiritual house, a spiritual house is built on Jesus being our cornerstone. Jesus Christ must be our cornerstone. Verse four, coming to him as to a or as to the living stone rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. What is he saying? That Jesus is a living stone. When we come to him, he is a living stone. 
I'm going to read a few of these, these stories or these verses that were written hundreds of years before Jesus Christ came talking about him. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. It may not be up there. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion, which is Israel, a stone for a foundation. This stone is a tried stone. It's a precious cornerstone, and it is a sure foundation. How many of you all, when you pray and you ask God for things, you want to make sure or you want to have the certainty and the confidence that God will do it? When you pray, you really want God to do it. Here's what he's saying. He's a sure foundation. You can trust him. And whoever believes in him will not act hastily. Psalms 118.22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Isaiah chapter 8.14. He will be as a sanctuary, which means a holy abode, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense where people stumble over him, and he will be that to both houses in Israel, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. He will be that as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. What is he saying is that your faith in God is not based upon where you grew up because Jewish people were considered God's chosen people. If they would not abide to God's word, they would then stumble over Christ because they would be offended by his word and they would stumble throughout life because they didn't abide by his word and 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 I don't know about y'all but I have certain times in my life where I recognize I'm offended by God's word but it only becomes an offense if I don't do what his word tells me to do does it make sense so he's saying now this word I don't care if you're Jewish, you're God's chosen people. I don't care if you're Gentile, non, non-Jewish people. This stone is the stone that you must live by, okay? So when he says he moves from a living stone to what we call a chief cornerstone, okay? So what is he saying? I want to show you this photo. When we went to Israel, this is not the photo from Israel, but this is in every place that we went. We looked at all of the archaeology. We looked at all of the buildings and how they put these things together. We had heard about the different wars where people had come and just had destroyed Israel. And many of the buildings, they were, you would have remnants of the buildings and some actually remained erect. And so when we were there, he talked about how every one of these buildings that were built in stone, they always started with what they call the chief cornerstone. Hear me on this. And some of these buildings were amazingly big. And so because of that, I want you to see that in every stone building, one stone is crucial. This stone is always laid first. And it is to ensure that the building is square and stable. Anything that you're building in your life, how many of you all want to build it uneven? Anything that you're building in your life, how many of you all want to build it unstable? Anything that you're building in your life that's of value to you, how many of you all are waiting for it to fall? You built that thing so that it could last, right? Okay, so uh, good. I got one right. Okay. For all of y'all other ones, I just guess I'll come over to your house and it won't be there tomorrow. Okay, okay. It's to ensure that the building is square and that it's stable. It is the rock upon which the entire structure rests upon. Since ancient times, Builders have used cornerstones in their construction of projects. The cornerstone is the principal stone. It's placed in the corner of the building. And the reason why it's placed there is because once you place it there, then every builder uses that stone to guide their work and to begin to help them build their course. The cornerstone was usually one of the largest and the most solid stones and it was most carefully constructed in a manner so that it could sustain the building. So here when Peter is talking about this cornerstone, here's what he's saying. Jesus is the cornerstone of our lives and of his church, which means that everything that we do and everything that we build should be built upon him. Uh, Yeah, I want that. Uh Uh-huh. Everything. 
Everything. You know, everybody say everything. Y'all knew what I was going to say. I'm from the South, so I was going to say everything. Everything. See, see, that makes me stop for a minute like, whoa. Like if I'm set apart, you're saying that everything that I build must be built upon Jesus. And you know what he's saying? Yes. Yes. He's the cornerstone. He's making this case that he is not only the cornerstone, but he is the chief cornerstone. That there's no other cornerstone that you could ever build anything with great quality. There's nothing you can build with great strength. There's nothing that you can build that can withstand storms storms without you building on the chief cornerstone. So here's my question. What are you building your life on? Is it your intellect? Is it your past offenses? That's what I used to build my life on. I used to build my life trying to be a dad based on what my dad was not for me. What do you think I built? Just a little bit better than my dad. And I never built to the manner in which God called me to build. I wanted to be a good father to my children. And my best example was my father who wasn't there. So you know what I thought? I was a good father because I was there. Then I started realizing those boogers needed a little bit more than me just being there. Right? So then I had to figure out how do I build? How do I build? And so you know what I did? I didn't know other other way to build. So I opened up the Bible. And I started realizing, wait a minute. I'm not supposed to, you know, just begin to cause my children to be angry. I'm not supposed to do certain things to them, but I am supposed to lead them and I am supposed to train them. And uh, I don't know about y'all, but I I could tap that behind, too, if they I know that's ungodly. I know that's ungodly now. I know it ain't. That's not what the Bible says. You spare the rod, you spoil the child. I'm just saying, but I know we different now. Timeouts and takeaways and that didn't work for Demo. My mama, my mother had to put that high heat on me. You hear me? She came from high and boy, I'm just joking. I'm joking. I'm messing with you. I just want to mess with some of you parents who you got your own way. Okay. Okay. But it says this, that he is the chief cornerstone. But if you don't hear this, hear me on this. That chief cornerstone is guaranteed and will most certainly be rejected by men. I can confirm this, that that chief cornerstone that will confirm stability in your life, that is stormproof, will be rejected by men. Because I've rejected him. Okay? But here's the question. Why do we reject God? Why do we reject him? It is hard to put our complete trust and faith in Jesus. It's hard to. Like it's hard, hard. Because we desire to see things happen the way that we see them. We want the things that we want. And so it is hard to put our complete trust and faith in God. And you know what that is called? Rejecting him. I wish I could come up with a nicer word, nicer phrase, but that's called rejecting him. See, when we reject him, it means that we only choose to build our own way and not God's way. When we reject him, it means that we cast the living stone aside Not caring that Jesus is the only foundation upon which we can build on and we choose to build upon our own foundation. When we reject him, we reject Jesus being the living stone in order to build our own way and not God's way. Hear me on this. So that means rejection is disbelieving that leads to disobedience. Disbelieving. I actually like the word disbelieving instead of just like disobedience. Like, okay, God, I'm not sure about that. Like, are you sure? Are you sure? And you know where that conversation started? In the Garden of Eden. When the serpent came and said, what did God really say? And the lady was like, well, he said that we got all of this stuff up in here. We can't touch that. 
And God never said, don't touch it. But you knew it was in her heart. I want to touch it. The devil found the place where she was disbelieving and exposed it to lead her to disobey. That's all that happened. That's all that happened. Disbelieving is when you're like, I'm not sure about that. I'm certain that that was just for those times. Surely he knows that I got a good heart. Ain't none of y'all. I'm playing with y'all. Godly. Right? You, you've not had those conversations. You've not had that Romans chapter 6 conversation where it says that when, when we sin, God's grace abounds all the more. You know what I try? It says if you sin, then God's grace becomes bigger than your sin. So you know what I tried to convince myself? Maybe I should do the big sins. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. If I'm going to get in trouble or if, it, if his grace is going to come, I don't want you to. No, I don't want you to your grace to be all used up on me just taking a cookie from the cookie jar. No, no. Use it on some big stuff, Jesus. You hear me? That's the type of those are the conversations I have with Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's what I do. Right. And we begin to have these mental conversations between and we think we're having it with God, but we actually have mental conversations with ourselves, Convincing ourselves That what we're doing is right. I told y'all me and John got married three times, right? Before we got married. Because I kept sinning with her. And so I was like, well, let's get married. We get on our knees and pray. God, forgive us for this sins. We won't do it ever again. And guess what your boy was doing? Sinning again. So I'd be like, let's do it. You know, that's what we do. We have these mental exercises of disbelieving. And then it leads us to disobedience instead of just humbly submitting ourselves to God's way. Not my way. His way. I'm not asking you to do what I'm telling you. I encourage you to do. I'm asking you to do what he tells us to do, right? So that's what we do. And so when we disbelieve, it leads to disobedience. But then for those of us, if we're really trying to walk this thing out with God, we begin to come to him. When we come to him, that means that we say, God, we place our trust in you. When we come to him, we say, God, we build our life on you. And I'm wrestling with this right now as my children are getting older and they're adults. Because I recognize this, even me as a parent, I don't know if I want them to do as much as Jesus wants them to do as I want them to do what I want them to do. I want them to do it my way. <laughs> That's the worst thing. Now, kids, that don't mean that you just go out there and do nonsense, okay? But I'm wrestling with this now. And you know what God is saying? Entrust them with me. Like, give them to me. Because now... It's them choosing to do things my way instead of you trying to protect them by doing things your way. Okay? So when we come to him, now we are trusting that he is the one that we can rely upon and we can build our lives upon. 1 Corinthians chapter, 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3.11 says it like this. For there is no other foundation, no other foundation, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. So the only true foundation that we can lay, the only foundation we can build upon, the only chief cornerstone we can build upon is building on Jesus, okay? So to become a spiritual house, if we're going to become a community of believers, we must be committed to being set apart and we must choose Christ as the chief cornerstone. We have one of two choices. We will either reject him or we will come to him. Like there's no other way in between. Because anytime we negotiate, we've already lost. Because we don't negotiate with God, so you're only negotiating with the devil. So anytime you negotiate with the devil, you lose. Once again, go back to that garden. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So then put your faith in him. Build your lives upon him because he simply won't fail. The song we sang, we sang it, I think it was the second song. Uh, I asked them, I didn't even ask them to sing it. They just had it in the rotation. But I want to I actually help you understand something. It says, some of the words, because I know a lot of us, we sing words uh, to songs, and we like the way the songs make us feel. Ooh, that was a nice song. I felt so good. We like maybe the way that it, it makes us feel. Well, I don't care about how a song makes you feel. I care about what it says. So we sang the song, Christ is my firm 
foundation, the rock upon which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad. Why? It's because I put my faith in Jesus and he's never let me down. He's been faithful through generations. So why would he fail me now? And here's what we say. And I don't know if you believe it or not, but you need to start believing it. He won't. He won't. He won't fail. He simply will not fail. And so when we say that Christ Jesus is our foundation, we are saying we trust you so much to build everything that we have and everything that we are on your foundation because we believe if we build with you, you won't fail. Now, if you build with him, you will change. If you build with him and you build on him, you're the ones who's going to have to adjust. If we're going to fit our relationships on the rock of Jesus, he might cause you to chisel off a few things so that it fits perfectly within his will. Oops, I'm too close to this mic, to this thing. But he may cause us to do that. If you're going to raise your children, he may cause you to adjust the way that you see so that you can do it the way he's prescribed. And so God is asking each and every one of us to build with him. He is the chief cornerstone. Last thing is, is that he is the living stone. We are the living stones. Everybody say living stones. So we build on him. Can we see it again? See see the photo again? So when we build on him, let me show you where you are. That's the chief cornerstone. Which one are you? You all are the mother stones. I need you to hear this. If you're a Christian, you're one of those stones. If you're a believer, you're one of those stones, which means you participate in building up God's house. And I know some of y'all be like, man, it's been a hard year. I don't want to be a stone. I want to be a pebble. You don't get that choice. (laughs) You know, you're one of those stones. Somewhere around there, you're one of those stones. And I know which stone I am. And I know it's scary, but I want to be the stone closest to Jesus. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult, but I'm safer next to him. I want to be as close to Jesus as I possibly can. And I want to, I want to support something in this thing that he's building. I don't want to just be a, an accoutrement. I don't want to be an upgrade. I want to be one of those things that is helping this thing stand. I don't want to be a shutter. I don't want to be the front yard. I don't want to be the windows. I want to be right next to the stone. Because then that means we're helping hold something up. And each one of you, you are a living stone. That's what he says. You are a living stone. So if God's house is going to be built, it is going to be built because you are a living stone. Everybody say living stone. And then I want you to say, I'm one of those. I tried to look at a couple of y'all. You didn't say anything. Go home and practice that. I'm a living stone. I'm a living stone. I don't feel like it, but I'm a living stone. I'm a living stone. I know people would say I'm not a living stone, but Jesus, you say I am. I'm a living stone, okay? So I want to read these two uh, scriptures to you and then scream at you one more time, then we'll be done, okay? All right. Verse five, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, 19. This is so important. He says, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers or foreigners. What is he saying? That a lot of people who are Christians don't feel like they belong or they don't feel like they're part. In this culture, the Jewish people felt like they had first right because they were called God's chosen people. Here, Peter is saying to those folks who are not Jewish, It doesn't matter if you're not Jewish. You're no longer a stranger and you're no longer considered a foreigner. But now you're a fellow citizen with the saints, with the ones who think that they got it right. You're just like them. And sometimes, Christians, you need to hear that because I think some of the things that keep us away from relationship with God and relationship with one another is we either feel like we don't fit or we feel like somebody is better than us spiritually. 
But if you listen to this, he says, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers or foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. Having built, being built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the what? There we go again. So Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also. I could stop and I could just preach on you also. To build God's house, some of us feel condemned, feel like, God, you wouldn't do it with me. He says, you also. To build God's house, some of us feel like, you know what, God, I do certain things right, but there's many things I do wrong. You also. To build God's house, some of us know we reject God. We choose our own. And you know what God says? You also. See, the beautiful thing about God is when we choose to live our lives for him, we don't have to be perfect yet. He starts building with us even in those moments. He will purify us. He will refine us. He will make us what we need to be. But let me tell you something. You can never, ever live your life thinking you are not worthy or you cannot be one of his living stones. For anyone here who feels that, God says, you also. All you have to do, all you have to do is to submit and say, God, I will build my life from this point on on your son, Jesus. You also being built together for the dwelling place of God in the spirit. What is he saying, man? Individually, we're called to be set apart. Corporately, we're called to build our lives and to rest and to trust everything that we build upon God. And then lastly, we have to recognize that each and every one of us, we are one of those living stones. What is a living stone? A living stone means that we've been built. We recognize that God is using us to build his spiritual house. This is the one that gets me. A living stone means that the master builder who is God can place the living stone just where he wants you to be. That messes me up because I at least want to say, God, this is where I want to be and this is what I want to do. And, and I believe that a lot of times, this is actually the greatest struggle with a lot of Christians. It's that we consider ourselves stones, but we want to do what we want to do. We want to, we want to do the things that we want to do. Maybe it's your personality. Well, I'm quiet and God wants you to go meet people and you choose not to because it's my personality. That means that you're a stone, but you have not allowed God to position you and put you in the place where he wants to use you. Maybe there's some gifts and things that God has placed on you, but you feel condemned because maybe you did something wrong, and, but you've repented and you said, God, I don't want to do it anymore. And he says, now I want to use you. No, I can't because I'm not perfect. Get, if you're waiting for perfect, you can't come to this church. And if, 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 you, if you're looking for perfect, the next church you go to, they're going to tell you to leave too. We're never looking for perfect. We're looking for a pursuit of God. And you will be refined as you pursue God. But a lot of us, it's like, God, you know, I want you to use me like this. I want you, you know, I'm so gifted in this area and I want you to use me like this. And God says, I actually want to use you over here. But no, 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 no. I'm so gifted and I'm so, I'm so blessed. I'm so articulate. I know I could preach the walls down. Okay, I want you to actually come over here. That's what happened to me when I started in ministry. I thought I was going to be like this cool minister and they had hired me. And the first day of work, I didn't know what, how to dress on your first day of work to work for a church. So I went in there with like a suit on. And uh, I came in to the, to the staff meeting with a suit on. And my pastor said, Daryl, I got a job for you to do. I was like, oh, man, you already want me to preach? You already like, and so he said, I have a job for you to do. I promise you. And so I was sitting there like, okay, good. And so he said, I need you to go out to the storage room, get the ladder. I want you to climb up that ladder and I want you to change the lights. I'm like, no, no, that's not what I'm called to. Oh my, I'm bigger than that. I'm better than that. And he said, then after you get done, I want you to go and I need you to turn on the water to the baptismal pit. The problem was is that the baptismal pit had like wood chips and spider webs. 
your boy had on his best outfit. And I'm like, certainly that's not what you've called me to. I'm a living stone supposed to allow God to use me however he wants to use me. But I've come into this thing saying, I will only allow you to use me this way. And then something humbled me and said, Daryl, go do it. My first day, I was up at the top of this thing, changing lights, changing lights. And then I got up underneath the baptismal pit. And I'm serious, y'all. I had cobwebs and wood chips all over me. And I got out and I began to, like, wipe these wood chips off. And it took me about three years of serving in ministry. And I realized what God did. God used my first day of work to show me what my life of ministry would look like. You know what God allows me to do? To touch the hearts of people who are blinded and cannot see him and the light comes on. You know what God allows me to do? To go in places with people that other folks are unwilling to go to get dirty with them so that they can become clean. And now from this point on, I say, God, use me however you want me to use. Some Christians are a little bit too pristy and pristine to do this thing for Jesus. Some people think that you can only use me this way. I want you to get dirty with Jesus. Get dirty with him. Be that living stone that he can say. And here's the truth. I ended up at the same place anyway. And I'm more prepared and more equipped to do what I do now without a suit on, with tight pants on, and funny Nikes now than I've ever been if I just thought it was just because they offered me a job. See, I'm a living stone now. And I want each and every one of you to know that God has called you to be a living stone. And it starts with us just placing our trust in him. I just sense it. Some of us, it's like, man, you know, I've been doing this thing for a long time. But my, here's my question. is like, have you solely and completely just placed your trust in him? I'm not talking about you placing your trust in the religion that your parents told you. I'm talking about you placing your trust in the God who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you on the cross. I'm talking about the one that if he challenges you, you're going to choose to accept his challenge. I'm talking about the one that if he needs to correct you, you receive his correction because you know blessings on the other side. I'm talking about the one who can change you. And then you say, God, now use me. Like, use me. Use me. Use my flaws. Use my brokenness. Use my family. Use my experiences so that it can show people that your house is a good house for them to go to. Because he is the one that we build our lives on. So if there's anybody here you recognize, man, you know what? I'm one of those people. Sometimes, you know what? I feel like this. I feel like, man. I can't be used by God. In a minute, I'm going to pray for you because he will. Maybe you're one of those ones that God can use you in certain areas, but he can't use you in this one area. He will. Or maybe you're just that one that's like, man, I know I reject God and I'm cool with it. Today, I want to encourage you, lay everything, not at the cross, lay everything on the cornerstone. Let him be the one that you trust. Let him be the one that you build upon. And let him be the one that you say, God, I'll adjust my life for you. I've done that. And I have a much better life now than I ever would have had before. I've lost more trying to build my own way than what I've lost building his way. And I want you to remember that song. He won't fail you. He won't fail you. He won't fail you. People may fail you, but he won't. Somebody may promise you something, he'll keep his. You might fail yourself and he'll lift you up because he's a firm foundation. If he won't move, all you have to do is stand still and wait on the Lord. He won't fail. Let's pray. Father, I honor you today. You're a great God. And I love, God, that we get to build our lives upon you. You are the rock of our salvation. Lord, even when storms come, we'll find joy. Because we know that we can trust in you. And the more we trust in you, the more we recognize you want to use us. 
just want you to think about what if God would use you to help build his house? How precious and how holy would it be? How beautiful it would be for someone who felt the same way you felt. And now they walk into this place and recognize it. Christ is my firm foundation. If there's anybody here who feels like, man, I feel condemned sometimes. Like maybe I'm looking at the rubble of my mistakes and I'm feeling like, God, you could never use me. I want to pray for you. If there's anybody who recognizes, man, in certain areas, God, I lay my life on this cornerstone. But in other areas, I keep to myself. And lastly, maybe there's somebody you recognize. I just reject you, God. But today I don't want to anymore. He's a special God. He's the only one that I've ever experienced that has made me feel whole and complete. And I want to give you the opportunity, if that's you, I want to pray for you. So with your eyes closed and your head bowed, if you're one of those three, just lift your hand up. I see them, and then you can put it down after you lift it up, and I want to pray for you. I thank you, God. God, I thank you for each person that that raised their hand. Because you know what you just said? I'm going to use you. The reason why you raised your hand is that you've always had this burning thing inside of you to where you knew that you were created for God's purpose. This is not a surprise. But now you say, God, use me. I may not know everything. I may not be perfect at it, but I'm going to build my life on you. I'm going to build my life. And God, I pray that you would allow each person here to receive your grace and your love. I pray right now that there will be no spirit of condemnation. I pray that you would lift that burden and help people understand you've been set free. I pray that no one would feel like, man, I've just been convicted. But what you've really done is you've been released. And we believe that you are a firm foundation. We honor you, Jesus. And we thank you. And we will be your living stones to build your house for you. It's in Christ's beautiful, magnificent, holy, and awesome name we pray. Everybody say amen. One thing I want to tell you, is I received an email the other day and, and uh, it was kind of it was kind of jolting for me because I don't think people really recognize it but I'm actually an introvert by nature like I have to do this and I don't like to and I can put on a good front and I know there's certain people you like you find joy talking I find joy walking away from people seriously But I recognize that that's not what God created me for. And that's not what God wants to use me for. And so I have to allow God to use me even when I don't want to be used. I have to allow God to extend even his ability to use me because I have to break out of my temperament. And so they said, man, I've never talked to the pastor. And I was like, man, that hurts me because I'm big on like, like connecting with people. Like it messed me up. So there are two things we're going to start doing at this church because if I got to do it, you do too. Number one is I'm going to try my best to stand at the back of that church and greet as many of you as I possibly can. And if I have the opportunity and I don't know you, please tell me who you are. If you let me, I'm going to run to my office. I'm going to be real with you. And I make it look cool to be like, hey, go. The other thing is this, we're actually going to implement once again, greeting. And so as we move forward, we're going to tell you, get up and greet someone. And don't you go to somebody that you know. Don't you do it. If I know that you're talking to somebody that you know, if you feel a Bible coming somewhere, duck. Okay. Because we're better together. We're better together. When we lock in, God makes us something special. And I cannot be who God has called me to be without you. 
And I want to encourage us. Let's live this thing together. Let's walk this thing together. And let's win together. Amen.